Hi, this is Marshall Toplansky. And Joel Kotkin. And welcome to the Feudal Future podcast. If you're listening, it means you're interested in creating a better future, one that values diverse discussion and preserves opportunity for the middle and working classes. This is why we started the show, to bring together ideas and people that challenge the notion of a hierarchical, socially stagnant, and centrally programmed future. Maybe you've experienced the rising costs of home ownership, diminishing job prospects, or the burden of over-regulation and increasingly censorship. This is happening in cities everywhere, and we recognize the need for new action. For this reason, we created the Beyond Feudalism Facebook group, a place for you to connect and share resources with like-minded people. Here you'll be able to ask questions, network, and share your own stories and ideas on how we can bring opportunity and common sense back into our civil discourse and governance. Consider this a hub for all things feudal, where we'll be sharing insights from our recent Beyond Feudalism report with Chapman University, clips and highlights from the podcast, and links to related content on topics such as housing, education, energy, transportation, and entrepreneurship. Much of our focus has been so far on California, but we expect to see this work and apply this work to conditions around the world. Well, as you can probably tell, we're not too excited about the path we're currently on as a society, but we are hopeful for what's possible. And if we can better understand what's happening and build momentum to overcome the trends, so much the better. So we encourage you to join the Facebook group via the link below to get involved and keep up-to-date information on all new developments. And for more information, my new book, The Coming of Neo-Feudalism, outlines everything that's happening and where we need to change. The link to that is also in the show description. So thank you very much for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy the show. This is Joel Kotkin. And this is Marshall Toplansky. And you're listening to the Feudal Future Podcast. Our society is being rapidly reduced to a feudal state, a process now being exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Millions of small businesses are near extinction. Millions more are losing their jobs. And many others will be stuck in the status of propertyless serfs. The big winners? have been the expert class of the clerisy, and most of all, the tech oligarchs, who benefit as people rely more on algorithms than human relationships. With this, around the world, the middle class is becoming more squeezed than ever, and it's having profound economic, social, and spiritual implications. Here on the show, we're having conversations with business, government, and citizen leaders like you to get to the core of these issues and explore how we can work together to form a better future than the one we're headed towards. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. I'm Joel Kotkin. And today we are delighted to have with us Pete Saunders, who is a longtime observer of Chicago and the Midwest, and uh, has been a a great contributor to our research over the years. Pete, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Marshall. And uh, so here it is. We're just after the Thanksgiving holiday, after the elections, and um, Chicago must be ebullient thinking about the the Biden election. Uh, what, uh, What are the expectations in Chicago for the coming Biden administration? Well, I think Chicago's pretty pleased, happy. Uh, You know, I think it's, uh, I think everyone knows that Chicago was in the crosshairs under the Trump administration. I mean, we were the picture of all that is evil about cities, uh, among a few other cities. So I think that uh, Chicagoans are pretty happy that uh, the city is going to be viewed probably a little bit more favorably now than it has been. But I think also, if the uh, Obama administration is any uh, anything to learn from that. Probably Chicagoans are learning that uh, 
keep your expectations in check. Uh, mm-hmm. Not everything came to light uh, when we had uh, not only a Democrat in office, but a Democrat from Chicago in right. office who brought lots of people from Chicago into his administration. And not everything turned out the way that it uh, often thought. But, you know, quite honestly, much of that might go to the way that people think of power and politics in Chicago and and how that's quite different from the way that it is in other places around the country. <laughs> but, so, but, but to the degree that you can have expectations and dream, what would you dream for? What's on, what's on the agenda? Well, I do think that one thing that I, I, I think that a President Biden is going to probably push for is uh, he may really start to push for uh, something that helps to unite uh, uh, our country by coming up with a policy or a program that uh, helps to bring back Rust Belt cities and Rust Belt states in general. Uh, yeah, there was a very interesting uh, piece that I saw, I can't recall, was it in the Times or the Post about, uh, I think, a Marshall Plan for the Midwest. Uh, it was basically for Appalachian cities. Uh, and it included uh, the mayors of uh, Pittsburgh, Columbus, uh, Cincinnati, Dayton, and a few at Louisville and some other cities who were basically saying that, you know, we've struggled for so long and we really need to have a Marshall Plan uh, for our kinds of communities that are really different from those on the coast. Uh, I thought it was interesting that that uh, whole article left out the uh, Great Lakes cities, which are you know, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, Chicago, Milwaukee, uh, but uh, they did sort of extend, extend the olive branch to them and say, uh, you know, we'd like to include them as well. But I, I think Biden might use this as an opportunity, uh, depending on what kind of support he gets from Congress, to try to extend that olive branch to cities uh, that have been in the sort of left behind phase. And I'd include Chicago uh, in that group. But, but Pete, I, what I wonder about is, what it seems to me that there are two factors, big cities, Chicago being one of them, that have to deal with. One is um, the COVID uh, reaction, which has still been much more powerful in 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 the urban areas um, and particularly in the poorer communities. But the other thing is is the rise of crime. Um, I mean, that's. I mean, I, I was reading today that. Minneapolis has had this big spike in crime, but one neighborhood in Chicago had more murders than all of Minneapolis. Um, how does that play out? I mean, I can't see how the president of the United States can reverse that. Yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard to say. Uh, I don't know how the, uh, the president can reverse that. Uh, I think that there are real limitations as to how a mayor can reverse that. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I really think that it's, indicative of real deep societal issues at at the community level. Uh, It's been a problem for a long time, crime in Chicago. Uh, It has uh, waxed and waned. It's gotten better, it's gotten worse at different times, but it has almost consistently been higher here uh, than in almost any other major city across the country. Uh, As you guys know, New York and Los Angeles and Chicago uh, probably uh, uh, had similar very high crime rates. New York and Los Angeles uh, both dropped dramatically and have stayed there. Chicago just has not. And uh, Well, New York and Los Angeles is cat- are catching up, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, good for them. Yeah, we don't want to. <laughs> but we no, aspire I don't... to here. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, Chicago's uh, really, really had a hard time dealing with that challenge. And uh, it, I don't see how any president can really deal with that. It, it's, it's really got to be, uh, I think, economic. Uh, I think it's going to have to be an economic solution to this. It's better jobs. It's better uh, opportunities for residents uh, of the city that hopefully make things a little bit better. But it's going to be a problem. You know what, Chicago, uh, as you know, was pretty heavily hit by the Black Lives Matter violence. Um, how, what has happened with that uh, since the since the outbreak of violence? Has have things 
have things uh, calmed down? Has there been a kind of a new arrangement that's been made between uh, the protesters and the city? Yeah, it has definitely calmed down. Uh, you know, and I think that you know the Black Lives Matter protests that took place uh, back then they kind of arose in the midst of the pandemic. It was a flashpoint, but then I think the pandemic kind of took over again mm. and kind of shifted the focus away from that. But uh, I, I think. The protests uh, identified a lot of different uh, issues that, uh, you know, really kind of came to the surface. But I, I, I kind of feel as if the region uh, is kind of settling back into the same patterns that it did prior to uh, to the protests. I can't see any real substantive change that's happening right now. Uh, I'd like to see that happen. Uh, I just don't know that there is. Well, your point earlier was that at the root of a lot of this stuff is the is the economic inequality, basically, yeah. that, that exists in cities like Chicago. And I just was wondering whether there's a heightened awareness to trying to come up with programs that address it, whether you think the Biden administration is going to be kind of focusing on that or kind of where the where the debate lies. Well, you know, uh, I think that this bubbles up. I, I, I do know that the uh, Lori Lightfoot administration, our new mayor. Uh, well, I don't know if I can call her new mayor anymore. It's been almost two years for her now. But uh, she's really brought inequality to the surface and tried to address it. But uh, I think she's just not had the ability to be able to focus on it because of you know all sorts of other uh, issues, pressing issues, uh, the Chicago budget, our finances, our fiscal situation here uh, being tops among them. But uh, I do think that she's going to have a kindred spirit in the uh, in the Biden administration. Uh, I think that we'll have an opportunity to have somebody who will uh, probably try to do some of those things on our behalf and address that inequality. I mean, there are a lot of good uh, uh, nonprofits and organizations that have been deeply uh, researching and studying Chicago and its inequalities and how to best uh, uh, change that. So I think that there are a number of ideas that exist that are out there that people are, can really tap into. But uh, I, I I tend to think that just the inequalities in Chicago are just quite deeper than they are in some other cities. Uh, and uh, I think it, it, it's the level of uh, social, and it, it, it's, it's not just inequality, it's economic and social isolation hmm. uh, in Chicago. Uh, and there are parts of uh, Chicago's where no one goes. And there's parts of Chicago where, uh, well, people don't cross the, the, the lines. You know, there are very hard, rigid segregation lines that are in Chicago. People right. don't in, rarely in, cross in, them. In Kotkin speak, we would call this tribalism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. here's, here's a, another issue, though. Um, I mean, it seemed to me that if, when we were... When Pete uh, gave uh, gave Wendell Cox and I a great tour of South Side of Chicago, and the lack of economic activity was really quite astounding. I mean, and by the way, you can see some of that in South LA. LA you can see it in East Oakland. You can see it in Fresno or all these different places. But what I wonder about is this: How do you attract businesses to come to a city when a there's been rising crime and disturbances. And the last part, which I've been reading about, maybe you could inform us a little bit. It sounds like uh, Chicago's growing its own crop of AOCs, of very far left people. Um, and will that make Chicago less attractive to business than it was, let's say, when Rahm was mayor? Yeah, it's hard for me to say. Uh, you're right. Uh, there are probably... Uh, uh, three, maybe four of all the uh, democratic socialist people that are now part of the city council. Uh, they have come in, into office over the last uh, couple of years. So, uh, and they've been very active about that. Um, what I think that, you know, the point you're, you're making though, Joel, is it has become very difficult uh, it has become very difficult to attract businesses to uh, long been very difficult to attract businesses to some areas. But what I do see is uh, incremental change uh, 
happening in in some areas and it moves very slowly it does not happen at the same pace that you see in probably some other areas that are more high growth but you do see uh extensions of uh, new development or gentrification moving into areas where it previously had not been considered. So, uh, if, for example, I just heard about a, a my little bit of background first. My dad was the pastor of a church in Chicago for about 10 years. Uh, the oldest black church in Chicago uh, started in 1847. It's called uh, Quinn Chapel AME Church. He was a uh, uh, pastor there for much of the 90s. Uh, and that was on the near south, is still on the near south side. And uh, when he was there, uh, it sits not very far from McCormick Place. Uh, it, uh, we saw, I saw uh, that it, at some point in time, development was going to extend further south and come into this area. It was uh, mostly a warehouse district, even though the church was there, mostly small warehouses uh, in the area. But over the last 20, 25 years, it's become the sparkling area of new development. Uh, and now just this morning, I heard about a proposal that's coming before the Chicago Plan Commission for an esports arena uh, that's going to be placed within a block of my dad's old church. Uh, and uh, so it, it's, to me, a, a thousand seat esports arena is so, uh, uh, incongruent, I guess, with what used to be there. It's just, it just boggles my mind. But that is something that's happening in, the, in that area. But uh, it's, it's still a challenge to bring more of that uh, to more of, uh, more of the city. You uh, know, the irony, the irony about Chicago is that <clears throat> there is so much talent coming out of um, University of Chicago, Northwestern, you know, the whole area. Um, that is strong in advanced areas of the economy, mm -hmm. data and analytics, uh, quantitative methods, uh, the hard sciences, you know, physical sciences. I mean, we're talking about a tremendous core of competence in that area, and yet there's no place for them to be employed once they get out. It's a net, net exporter of major talent. Mm -hmm. And it didn't used to be the case when we were more in the industrial model where we could utilize those people. But now the, the folks that are coming out of that, if they're not in the financial industry for trading and using quantitative methods that way, um, they're not a whole lot of high tech Naperville like uh, uh, places that they can go. Right. Right. Yeah. I think you're right. Uh, I think that, uh, at the top end and at the bottom end, you're seeing lots of people say that there's little chance at opportunity uh, and they're, they're leaving. Uh, there are people who are leaving at the top to say, you know what, uh, I got my uh, University of Chicago education. I'm going to take advantage of it on the East Coast or West Coast. Uh, and then there are poor people, uh, low income people who say, you know what, I just don't see the opportunity here. I'm going to move to Atlanta or I'm going to move to Dallas. Uh, and they say that you know they they get out of uh, they get out of town and they they get a middle wage job somewhere else. Uh, what ends up happening though is you have a middle income uh, cohort in Chicago who sticks around, but uh, by staying around they increasingly become poor uh, and uh, probably more isolated as a result, which kind of fuels much of the crime issues that we talk about and and everything else. One thing is um, one of one of the things that we've we've talked about um, is is that there's um, I mean a lot of the cities like you mentioned earlier Columbus Indianapolis they seem to be recovering pretty well from the pandemic and have been actually attracting um, immigrants uh, have had growth in the minority population good jobs. Why is Chicago falling behind so many of the other Midwestern cities that seem to be coming back? Well, I think uh, a Columbus and an Indianapolis in particular are cities that tend to follow what I'd call a Sunbelt model. Hmm. Uh, and they've continued that for quite some, I mean, they've done that for some time. Uh, you know, I spent my college years in Indiana 
and uh, saw, you know, 30 years ago that Indianapolis took a very different tack towards uh, growth than what Chicago did even back then. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Chicago tends to be uh, still burdened by its industrial past. Uh, Indianapolis was never the same industrial behemoth that Chicago or Detroit or Cleveland were. Uh, and I think that uh, we end up having uh, uh, probably uh, a workforce and a population here that uh, is probably uh, undereducated relative to uh, other communities, and that uh, causes some concerns here. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, Columbus and Indianapolis benefit from being, uh, I've always said, being state capitals as well as the largest cities. Uh, I'd even put Minneapolis in that. Uh, hmm. position to uh, Minneapolis and Columbus also having not only a state capital, but uh, the, the flagship university of right. their states. Uh, so uh, that gave them, uh, I think, an advantage over uh, similar cities that, uh, that they, they kind of rolled the, the winds. Yeah, but you know what? You're, you're, you're sounding so clinical about this, Pete. <laughs> I mean, truly, I, I, I'm not buying into this at all. I'm, I'm just the, I'm, the, the thing that you haven't talked about, which I wonder how you really think about it, is the, the history of corruption and the, and the really difficult, dirty business environment of Chicago. I mean, how much of that is, first of all, am I making it up? Is it and the second, how how pervasive is it? If I'm not making it up, well, uh, well, the history of corruption is pretty steep, pretty deep here, uh, and I think uh, it's hard for me to say. Maybe I've been here too long. It's hard <laughs> for me to say uh, how much of it really influences. Uh, uh, our ability to grow. I, I can't really say if I see people from elsewhere considering Chicago and saying, you know what, uh, we're not going to move to Chicago because it's just too corrupt. What I do see is a lot of people who are saying, uh, businesses who are saying, you know what, we'll, we'll learn how the game is played there and we'll play accordingly. Um, but uh, I do think that, uh, uh, yeah, there's all these other factors that contribute more. And maybe I sound clinical, yes, but uh, I don't know. I, I just really can't say how much I believe the, uh, the corruption issue in Chicago really matters. But I, the point maybe that I, you know, and I know Pete, you've written about this um, and, and I think it's really important is whereas other cities that we've worked with, let's say, you know, with what Aaron Wren is doing in Indianapolis or, uh, but we've worked on it with Kansas City, um, that there's a, uh, that these areas seem to, A, maybe have the advantage of being smaller that, and in a distributed work environment, um, the, you know, the, um, the, the advantages of Chicago, you know, I always think about the airport and the central location, maybe um, that doesn't matter quite as much as it maybe it did at one time. Um, but also, it seems to me that Chicago made a bid to become a leading global city, that it put its eggs in, you know, uh, we're not, you know, we're not going to be a the capital of the Midwest. We're not going to be uh, an industrial city. We're not going to be a less expensive alternative, um, as opposed to um, uh, where the, what, what I wonder about is, Chicago has not been able to compete in media, in tech, in, uh, in many of the fields where California and the Northeast have been stronger. Is there a need for Chicago to get a, a, a more um, uh, grounded strategy that's actually as opposed to sort of the grandiosity? Or, that, or more contemporary strategy. Well, yeah, that would be good too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually 100% agree with you there, Joel. Uh, I do believe that Chicago's future really lies in becoming, once again, and reasserting itself as the capital of the Midwest. Uh, and I think, actually, the Midwest's future uh, really relies on Chicago being able to do that. Uh, 
because uh, I think uh, the, the futures of both are intertwined in that way. Chicago rose because of its connection to the, to the hinterlands and the hinterlands rose because of their connections to Chicago. Right. And I think that something similar has to happen again. Um, I think about a year ago, I wrote a piece uh, in response to something that I heard uh, on local radio, uh, where on public radio here, the people's, uh, there was a, there's a, a show called Curious City, uh, where people ask questions uh, about the Chicago area. And someone asked the question, is Chicago Midwest? Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, well, that seems like a <laughs> idiotic question to me. Over, or Chicago is not just Midwest, it's the center of the Midwest. And, but there are many people who, because we've made this global city uh, pursuit, who believe Chicago has much more in common with a San Francisco or a uh, New York uh, than it does with uh, a Minneapolis or a Detroit. And uh, so there are a lot of people who associate Midwest with parochial, small town, rural, uh, and they say Chicago is obviously not that, but uh, so therefore we're not Midwest. Well, I think that's the wrong approach. And I think that that's probably because we did go this global city route that hasn't worked out so well for us. Although, uh, I, although to be fair, you know, you look at the West Loop, you look at the, you know, the tech investments that have been going in mm-hmm. in, the, in the kind of new, you know, revitalized areas near Chicago Stadium, the old Chicago Stadium. And, um, uh, you know, it looks like from somebody coming in from the outside, hey, this is a viable alternative to, you know, Silicon Valley or to San Francisco oh, yeah. or to, mm-hmm. but it's, the problem is that it's just there, right? It's just, it's not affecting, there's, there are two economies. Well, and also two economies, location yes. quotients lower, Marshall. Say again. The location quotients for tech and things like that are. Are significantly lower. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In Chicago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and which is odd, right? Location quotients, for those of you who don't know, are the density of employment. Typically, they use it for employment or number of businesses in a particular industry. So if you look at advanced industries, um, Chicago typically has a lower density of those than other places, especially the emerging tech hubs. But the point that we're making here is that the, the base of the old economy is not keeping the new economy afloat. In other words, they're just too completely separated um, economic ideas here. And I think that's one of the issues that you're finding in Chicago. And I wonder how you bridge that. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, I, I do think that uh, what I've seen, and I, actually I've seen Aaron Wren write about this pretty extensively too, is that the new economy in Chicago just is not big enough to carry the entire uh, metropolitan area. Uh, it's just uh, because we are, you know, so big, uh, you know, we're just under 10 million people in terms of our uh, uh, population in the metro area. Uh, but uh, we have an economy, the new economy, uh, the, the parts that you're talking about in the West Loop, the near north side, things like that, where uh, many of these things are happening. Uh, if that were its own metropolitan area and was Seattle size, we'd be talking about Chicago very differently. Mm. Uh, but uh I think because we have this legacy that uh, uh, from our industrial past, uh, it's not been strong enough to be able to carry everyone uh, through uh, uh, through to the next level. So, uh, yeah, again, I I just say if it was Seattle size, we'd be talking very differently about Chicago. We'd be saying talking about it much more like how we uh, many people make talk about Minneapolis, which I view as a, a Midwestern success story too. So, uh, yeah, you know it, what, it's a tough thing. I'm going to make a plug for Chicago because Joel and I are involved in, in a lot of different projects for different geographies. And one of the things I've noticed about Chicago that you have in, in great surplus is civic pride and civic involvement. Mm-hmm. This is something that, you know, if there's a, if this is going to be a solvable problem, Chicagoans will solve the problem because they want to. There is a desire to be able to do that because of the pride of place. And yeah. um, I think that's something that Chicago has going for it. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think that it is uh, a source of pride that we have the pride that we do. Uh, Chicagoans are very proud of the city, uh, believe in the city, and I think that uh, they're working hard to make it a better place. I think that uh, uh, there are Chicagoans who have solutions and are ready to put them in place. Uh, I do think that there are assets that uh, the city has. It, you know, we sit on uh, uh, one of the five Great Lakes. We sit next to one of uh, the primary sources of fresh water on the entire planet. I think that as uh, climate change and uh, access to water changes over the next, uh, over the long term, over the next the remainder of the 21st century, people will give Chicago another look because of those factors. Uh, I think that we do have talent uh, in some areas, uh, principally in uh, logistics and, and professional services that are really strong. Uh, I think that uh, Chicago's problem is uh, often been those we don't we've never really learned how to capitalize on the strengths that we do have. We haven't put them, I mean, even on the financial side, you know, when you have like the, the board of trade and, uh, you know, we haven't been able to uh, you know, turn that into something uh, as extensively uh, for its growth as, as maybe New York has with, with Wall Street. And maybe uh, it, it should have uh, put more effort into making that happen. I don't know. Well, but let's think, think about the, here's, here's a, a great wrap up for you to think about mm -hmm. and, and opine on. Um, as we think about the emergence or the, the, the continued existence and thriving of the middle class, will Chicago be able to position itself as a great place for the middle class to, to live, to thrive, to build generational success? Yeah, I do think so. Uh, I do believe that Chicago is, is well positioned uh, to be able to be a success story for the middle class. I, I do think that uh, once uh, we're able to generate the kind of economic growth that we'd like to see, people will see it as, uh, as, as an affordable place relative to the east or west coast. Uh, I do think that it, people will see it as a livable alternative to uh, some of the places that you see on the east or west coast. Uh, I do think that, uh, you know, Chicago is walkable, but not as uh, dense as a place like New York City. Uh, Chicago is drivable, but not as crowded as a place like Los Angeles. Uh, and it, it can come across, uh, or it can become something that is a, a middle ground alternative and a, a, a middle class uh, uh, hearth. Uh, for people uh, in America. So I really do think that it's, it's, it's got a unique charm about it and a unique, unique uh, building environment. It's got uh, all these uh, factors that can really play into it being a middle-class hub once again. But uh, we just have to find the right economic key to be able to get us going in that direction. That's great. Well, Pete Saunders, thank you so much for being our guest on the Feudal Future podcast, and we look forward to having you back in future uh, future episodes. This was a great uh, a great opportunity to get your perspective on a great city. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you too. Thank you.